You can contact Joe Baker. He helps folks set up meetings on uh, getting kids in their school fired up on to do something in their local school. Joe had me come speak at his high school in Pennsylvania. They had an auditorium seats about 1,000 people. They had 1,500 people come. The, fire, the pr principal was pulling his hair out, nervous as a cat, thinking the fire marshal's going to come you know, arrest me and throw me in jail. You know? They turned away like 300 people at the door said, no, you can't get in. And I spoke for over two hours at that public high school in Pennsylvania. Joe Baker arranged the whole thing, and he's been on fire for God ever since. You get a hold of him say, what can I do in my school? If you're a public school student and you want to do something, Joe can help you get going. Um, some practical steps. You can give your teachers a video to watch at home. You can pray for them. Teaching is a tough job. My brother's in his 34th year. He said, Kent, it's not fun anymore. I can't wait to quit teaching. I'm, about, I'm sick of this. I'm teaching public school up in Illinois. My mom retired from teaching public school. You can invite your teachers to a creation seminar. You can have them call me with any questions. You can ask my secretary, Martha, sitting right there. I take questions all day long and half the night. <laughs> I'll be glad to help. You can ask them to have a creation speaker speak in your public school. I've got a list of about eight pages of names of other people that speak on creation. We'll be glad to get somebody to you as quick as we can. You, some of you could run for school board. You could influence the textbook selection committee. You could pass or enforce the laws requiring books to be accurate. The Bible says the fear of man bringeth a snare. And we got a bunch of Christians that are scared to do anything for fear somebody might not like them. <laughs> a duh. <laughs> We're supposed to be Christians, you know. They didn't like the disciples very well or Jesus himself, did they? Our job is to do what's right. Leave the results up to him. Okay. You can try to convert the teachers or the students. You could write letters to the editor. That's what got my whole ministry started, brother. You and I were working together at the factory at M&A. Article came out of the newspaper that said, Dinosaur bones are found from 80 million years ago. And I wrote my first ever letter to the editor. I'd never written to the, letter, to the editor before. I said, these dinosaur bones were from the flood of Noah, 4,400 years ago. Well, man, you would have thought I shot the sacred cow. <laughs> For the next six or eight months here in Pensacola, I got called every name you can imagine in the paper. And I wrote letters back and forth, and they, other people wrote letters. And finally, the university asked me to come do a debate, and a couple churches asked me to come speak. And now it's 14 years later, and I've got 30 people on my staff, and get, what, 20 calls a week, Martha, asking me to come. <laughs> 55? <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's crazy. There's a war going on. Get in. Amen. Find something to do. You can donate some creation books to your public library or public school library. We get calls and letters just about every week from somebody getting saved because they watched a book, watched a video or read a book that they checked out of their public library. One of our videos. Donate some. You could educate others to use creation as a means of evangelism. Here's what the ACLU will do, though. They will threaten a lawsuit if somebody tries to teach creation. Now, they know they would lose, but it doesn't matter. The fact that it's going to be a lawsuit is going to be costly for the school. So the ACLU, knowing they'll lose, threatens to sue, and sometimes even sues, knowing the school will back down for fear of not having enough money to defend themselves. They're winning by default. They claim teachers can only teach what is state in state-approved curriculum. Well, that's a lie. The curriculum really starts when the classroom door closes. Every teacher knows that. And every teacher discusses things in their class that are not in the textbook. <laughs> Come on, you can't teach otherwise. They claim teachers cannot correct the curriculum. That's a lie. They do it all the time. I taught math and science for years. I was always making corrections in the math book. And they mislead people into thinking that evolution is a sacred part of science that's never to be questioned. They use peer pressure or ridicule to silence those who oppose lies in the textbooks. Now, if you're going to do something, you be prepared for opposition from the enemy. Satan protects his evolution theory with a vengeance. This is the foundation for all sorts of things. Roger DeHart, science teacher at Burlington Edson High School in Seattle, was told he could not inform students of errors in the textbooks just simply by passing out current science journals. If there's a current science journal that said this is wrong, he couldn't tell his students because in the book it said it was right. Some of these lies have been proven wrong 100 years ago. Kevin Haley, biology teacher at Oregon Community College, lost his job simply for exposing errors in the textbooks. Baylor University, formerly Christian University, fired William Dembski just because he advocated intelligent design. He said there must be a designer. Forrest Mims was a science writer for 20 years. He published in National Geographic, Science Digest, American Journal of Physics, 60 magazines and newspapers. He was denied a job as science writer or writer for Scientific American simply because he was a creationist. Rod Levake in Fairbault, Minnesota, 
uh, was reassigned because he doubted Darwin's theory. They said, we don't want you teaching evolution. We don't want you teaching biology if you doubt Darwin's theory. Dan Clark in Lafayette, Indiana, uh, he quit because he was reprimanded for teaching an evolution alternative. The superintendent, Mr. Ed Eller, told him not to introduce creationism to this class. Well, Mr. Ed Eller, you need to get a different job. We are grass needs mowed once in a while. Come on down, we might put you to work if you're a hard worker, okay? He said, I'm quitting, I'm not going to take this. There's all kinds of articles here. Dean Kenyon was a tenured professor in San Francisco at the university. He'd been teaching for years. He wrote books about evolution, how wonderful evolution was. He was the poster boy of the evolutionist. And then one day he got converted and they fired him. But he said, hey, I got, I got 20 years, you can't fire me. Oh, okay. They put him in as a lab assistant, you know, washing test tubes. Had to go through a whole big lawsuit just to get his job back, simply because he doubted Darwin's theory. So don't think it's going to be an easy road. There's some things you can do. Cut the pages out. Get something done in your area. There's all kinds of practical steps. You can watch our video four for other stuff like that. All right. Why is this theory dangerous? It's dangerous because it's bad science backed up by lies. Number two, it brings forth bad fruit. All the effects of evolution that I know of are evil and wicked. We teach the kids they're an animal. We teach them there's no moral standard. There's no absolute. What do you expect? This theory has led directly to the rise of communism, humanism, Marxism, Nazism, socialism, and the coming new world order. The dangers of this evolution theory. Folks, it's not just dumb. It's dangerous. You're going to be shocked and see how many, to see how many people have died because of this theory. Why did we fight the Vietnam War? Why did we fight World War II? Why was World War I fought? Why are we fighting against communism? How many people did Hitler kill? How many did Stalin kill? We'll cover all that tomorrow night. Well, let's continue now with what we talked about last night, about the dangers of the evolution theory. We talked, answered the question, or began answering the question, why is evolution a dangerous theory? We talked about the fact that it's bad science based on lies. Kids do not learn how to think when all they're taught is this evolution theory. It's like me asking somebody to explain how computers came to be, but you cannot use man as your answer. You have to give a naturalistic explanation. <laughs> well, you've already shut out the only logical answer. And the kids are in school are tr trying to learn how the universe came to be, but it can't be God. It's got to be something else. Well, you already shut out the only logical answer. So they're not learning how to think. It's a dangerous theory for science. It's a, it's a hindrance to the advancement of science, and it brings forth bad fruit. The Bible says an evil tree, every good tree which bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Evolution is the foundation philosophy for humanism. The idea that man is God of the universe. The humanist philosophy is talked about in Romans chapter 1. It says they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, so God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. You ought to read all of Romans chapter 1 and see the steady slide people go down once they reject God as the creator. This fellow said, do humanists believe in a supreme being? Emphatically, yes, that supreme being is man. Humanists have no knowledge of any being more supreme. Well, I would be glad to introduce them to one if they'd, be, if they'd lie. I know one. Amen. It's a whole lot more supreme. I mean, can you imagine if the infinite God could fit in your little three-pound brain? <laughs> it wouldn't be very big, and he sure wouldn't be worth worshiping. Man, the God that I worship is beyond comprehension. Amen. I mean, he tells us a lot about himself, but your brain just can't handle it. Neither can mine. So. This guy said, the turning point in history will be the moment that man becomes aware that the only God of man is man himself. Some of these guys think they are God. Boy, that was Hitler's philosophy. I'm God. I'm God. I'm God. I'm God. I'm God. I'm God. Hey, Gabriel, come and listen to this. Ha, 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 ha. We're not such big stuff, folks. <clears throat> George Wald, the Nobel Prize winner, said, I will not accept that, talking about creation, philosophically, because I do not want to believe in God. Therefore, I choose to believe in that which, is I, know is that which I know is scientifically impossible. Spontaneous generation arising to evolution. He said, I know it's not possible, but the only other alternative is God did it. And I don't want that, so I'll believe the impossible. Well, you're going to feel awful stupid for eternity 
no one, you missed the opportunity to live forever with the Creator of the universe because you were willingly ignorant, just like 2 Peter says. This guy says, we no longer feel ourselves to be guests in someone else's home. He's talking about God. This is Rifkin, who's one of those tree huggers who writes all kinds of books about, you know, save the environment, kill all the people but save the environment. Jeremy Rifkin said, we no longer feel ourselves to be guests in somebody else's home and therefore obliged to make our behavior conform to a set of pre-existing cosmic rules. It's our creation now. We make the rules. We establish the parameters.